Amen. Can y'all hear me? If you would, open your Bibles to Psalm 128. We are going to look at leaving a godly legacy as we finish here our winding down our study on the family and building godly families. And Psalm 128 is a, is a beautiful psalm. And uh, I had a great time and really enjoyed studying Psalm 128. Just this past week, uh, I guess the week before Father's Day, and actually Psalm 128 is be a great song for Father's Day, a great Father's Day message. But uh, I read a commentary, I guess, uh, last week by Al Mohler on fathers and on Father's Day. And one of the statistics he cited there was he said that, I forgot who he cited, but he said 87 million Father's Day cards were, were going to be sold this year. I thought, wow. Not, I, I'm assuming maybe that's worldwide, but he said 87 million. He said, he said that the majority, the majority of those cards would pitch your fathers in a not so positive light, a negative light. And he said, now, a lot of that is humor. You know, you get the Father's Day card with the dad sitting on the sofa, the couch potato, and you know, where's the remote, and that sort of thing. But one of the things, even though it's humorous, one of the things he said was that uh, this is an indication of our cultural confusion on the necessity of fathers. That they're even needed. That they're, that they're necessary. And uh, he cited some other stats that I think in 1960, one out of every 10 children were fatherless. And he said then today, 2014, it's up over 30, well over 30% of children. And, and I gotta tell you, you may have heard me say this before, but the last 10 years of coaching college basketball, I can tell you that over 75% of the young men that I coached uh, had no fathers in their home. Single parent home, the majority of those homes being absent fathers. Uh, and that's, that's an incredible statistic. One of the other things I was cited in that, that passage was that he said all pathologies with boys problems, all pathologies. Virtually every single one of them can be traced, statistically tied back to the absence of the father in the home. And that's pretty astounding. And uh, you've also probably heard me mention that one of, one of the sweetest times for me was when we lived in Denton. And uh, I had some men in that church there that took me under their wing. And one of those guys' names was Dr. Lloyd Campbell. He's retired professor from the University of North Texas and he ran the jail ministry and he just took me out of Bible study one day and he said, you know, you need to go with me. We're going to go to jail on Sundays. And we did that. And we did it for a couple of Sundays, uh, maybe two or three. And then he said, you know, Fred, you need, to, you need to go down and get your permanent badge. You need to go down and see the chaplain so you can keep coming in here with me. I, I think I may have told the story. but uh, So I went down to see the chaplain, uh, uh, Mr. Bob Garcia. And I walked in and I introduced myself and and he said, hang on just a second, son. And he picked up his phone and dialed, dialed, dialed somebody down the hall. And he said, yeah, I got this boy, uh, Fred Wright here. Said, yep, yes, sir, yeah. And he's he's going to have pod number uh, number 30. He's going to have a pod of men. You need to get him a badge. I'm going to send him down there to you. Click. And I was nervous. I was, uh, Mr. Garcia, uh, I've only been coming you know, a couple of weeks with, with Mr. Lloyd. I'm just kind of, you know, in training. <laughs> and he, uh, he looked at me. He said, son. It's time for you to fly. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, it scared me to death. But I went down and got my badge. And I started going to that jail on Sunday afternoon. And I learned really quick that when you brought up the subject of fathers, for those guys behind the bars, uh, you know, a lot of them were at the end of the rope. And it would bring tears to their eyes. They never, they never had a daddy. And they would say that, you know, I wish I just had somebody when I was young that would have snatched me in line and told me this is the way to do things. It would have taught me the Bible and the Scriptures. And those in there that did have fathers, they were sorrowful that they didn't pay attention to their fathers. And a 
a lot of times those that have fathers have abusive fathers. So the world needs godly fathers. The nation needs godly fathers. You contrast what I told you with uh, the father of Psalm 128, you know, who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. Uh, he works. He eats the labor of His hands and is happy. You can see the progression in this psalm. It goes from the father to his labor and his work. And then his, he has a fruitful wife, a wife who flourishes in the center of his house, in the center of his home. And he's got children who are like, who are like olive plants that grow, grow into olive trees and bring life to the dark world. And the fear of the Lord in this man, leading his family, is what blesses his family. Not only blesses his family, but it blesses the city. And he goes on out and it blesses the nation. It's a blessing to the nation. Um, it's a song, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And isn't that the truth? And that's the absolute truth. Uh, you see this a lot in the psalm, Psalm 112. Uh, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. And then it talks about his children. It says, His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. So it's good to have a dad in the home who fears the Lord and finds great delight in the commands of the Lord. So that's what we're going to look at. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to look at Psalm 128, leading a, a legacy, a godly legacy for your children. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for your word that. Uh, you showed us how to live. And Lord, I pray again that you would give us a thirst for the scriptures. That you would help us in our homes to be godly parents. And then as parents, that we would not be walking contradictions. That we would live out what we say in front of our children. So that they too would leave a godly legacy. Lord, guide us when we write the divine scriptures. We pray for your blessing on us in Christ's name. Amen. You know, as you look at you know, studies on the family also, one of the things I didn't mention, uh, it's so clear, it's so clear that the influence of a godly man in the home and what it does for a child. And would y'all agree that there's a lot of confusion on that in our culture today? That there's you know, gender confusion. You know, it's okay for somebody not to have a dad. Now, I know we've got single moms out here, and they're working hard. And I'm going to tell you, we've done a lot with this body of believers to help single moms, and I salute you. And I think you would be the first ones to attest to the fact that uh, we need God and fathers. It's, uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, my friend Coach Kevin Brooks over at ASU used to say it's it ain't rocket surgery, Coach. <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, we need God and fathers. So let's look at Psalm 128. Get my notes here. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to read through the whole thing and we'll go back and take a look at it and break down each verse. This is a, a psalm of ascent. And what that means is these were sung three times a year as the Jews would go up to Jerusalem for the feasts three times a year. And you say up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is about 2,700 uh, feet above sea level. So they were called Psalms of Ascent. And they would sing these. And I, I would imagine that when they sing this song, they're singing about a godly father blessing not only his house, but the nation. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in His ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall a man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion. And may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Well, let's take a look at this. In this first verse, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in His ways. What does it mean to fear the Lord? This man is happy because he fears the Lord. He's blessed because he fears the Lord. First of all, fearing the Lord means fearing 
His attributes that he, and mainly being His holiness. That you fear God in His holiness. That He's separate from the creation. That He's absolutely morally perfect in His righteousness. So you fear Him in His holiness, in His person. Uh, you fear Him in His power. That He's all powerful. That He's omnipotent. And it's a word for reverence. Uh, it's reverential awe. It's uh, deep respect and honor. That's what it means to fear God in His holiness. You see Isaiah, we're about to study Isaiah in the next few weeks with Akan, I believe. I think he's going to start a series. And you see Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, and he sees the Lord, the Lord's holiness, and he says, Woe is me, for I'm undone. Uh, for my eyes have seen the king, I have to go in the midst of the people with unclean lips, and I'm a man with unclean lips. You don't hear me? I'm kind of adjusting in this. So that's what it means to fear the Lord and reverence His holiness. But it also means to fear His law and His rules and His regulations. Because obviously God's law is a reflection of His character. It's a reflection of His holiness. It's who He is. God says, do this. Obey me. Because these laws reflect who I am. So when we violate God's law, we violate not only His law and His rules and His commandments, but violate God Himself because it's a picture of His character. So, fearing the Lord is filled with fear of His laws. Sorry, my ears are not holding this up. <laughs> Can y'all hear me okay? And then also, the fear of the Lord is fearing the consequences of breaking His laws. Fearing the consequences of breaking His laws, which would be His judgments. His judgments. And you've heard me ask this question before. Is God perfect in His judgments with man and how He deals with lawbreakers? You better believe it. That's why we fear Him. We fear the law. We fear the law. We fear the Lord. We fear, fear the Lord's law and His consequences of breaking His law. Uh, so how does a man live? He walks in His ways. That's where a man's walk shows that he actually fears the Lord. Well, what does it mean to walk in His ways unless... How can you know what that means unless you know what His ways are? That's what the psalmist says. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on His law, He meditates day and night. So the man of God knows God's law. He knows what it says. Because that's the only way you can walk in it unless you, is that you know what it says. And then look what, what the psalm says. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. You know, this verse here doesn't, doesn't promise wealth. You know, and I talked about this verse with Pecan this week, and uh, he reminded me that I was rich. You know, because I think I made the comment, well, you know, I'm not rich, but he said, oh, yes, Fred, yes, you are. And he was right. That God has prospered me in a way because... I eat the labor of my hands and I'm happy and it's well with me. And it's not because of anything that I've done. It's because of fear of the Lord. That comes from the fear of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, it's coming from a guy who's, maybe he's, whose career was ended about a year ago. Uh, I had a pretty big life-changing moment, I guess, if you want to call it, where I was fired from my job. And God has provided me with work where I can provide for my family. And I told the con, I said, I think I may be the happiest I've ever been in my life. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I, I sleep well at night, and I'm thankful to God that I can eat the labor of my hands. And let me ask you this, is, uh, is idleness a sin? Yes, it is. A man should work. You know, I could easily sit down and sit on my hands and say, well, I'm not going to work because I'm, I'm a college basketball coach and I can't find a job, so I'm just not going to work. I'm going to draw an employment. Let me tell you, I think we do man in, 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 in indignity and disservice when we give a man an incentive to not work. There's something that has dignity about work. something about work that has dignity. Uh, Paul said, if any man would not work, neither should he eat. Let each man eat his own bread. Paul told Timothy, uh, if any would not, any would not care for his own, especially those of his own household, 
He's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. So it's good to work. Uh, we're going to be working in the kingdom. We've got work to do uh, when Christ come, comes back. Uh, Christ says, that, Paul says, do you not know that we will judge the angels? We're going we're gonna to judge the world. We've got work to do. So work is a good thing. And when a man fears the Lord and sits down at his table after a hard day's work, uh, he can eat the labor of his hands and be happy and he can be well with him. And look how this carries over to the rest of his family. It says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. You know, what a... What a blessing from the Lord. You know, you've heard the concept this past couple of weeks about the blessing of life. A good wife is hard to find. But this wife here is flourish, flourishing in, in the man's home. She's fruitful. And I don't think that just speaks to bearing children. She's happy. She's godly. She has a husband who loves her as Christ loves the church. And uh, things are well with her. She's cared for. And she's the delight of her husband. This husband have a, has a wife that he loves. And I can tell you that my wife is my delight. I'm, I delight more in the simplicity of my home, my wife, my children, and anything else that I have. And it's the main thing that I'm thankful for. And that's what I think that we thank God for. The man who fears the Lord sees the eternal things because he knows that his wife and his children are the most important thing, not his labor wife and his children, not his job. And then look what it says next. Your children like olive plants all around your table. <laughs> I mentioned that to, to this morning uh, to my Sunday school class. And, you know, this man's happiness is in his children and in his family, the simplicity of his family. Uh, one of the things we do, one of the things I do with my little ones, and I can mention them by name now, to get to Dr. Briley and Edward. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Riley's five and Edward's three. One of the things we do maybe a day or two a week is when everybody's waking up, I get Riley and Edward, we go get donuts. We go to Jack and go donuts, which is just right around the corner from my house. And uh, we get back and we sit down and we sit at the breakfast table. And we have our donut. And one of the things Ember does, she eats all the frosting off the donuts. That's really all she eats. She's sitting over there with pink icing. We always get two pink, two chocolate, and two blueberry and a bag of holes. So the guy, the guy working the drive-thru, he knows the usual. <laughs> and he just gets it ready to come for us. And uh, this week I was thinking about this, this verse, like, like olive plants all around the table. With a little ember, just out of the blue. She frantically starts tapping me. Dad, Dad, Dad. Jesus died. Jesus died, Dad. And I said, yes, he did. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus did die. And then Riley interrupts. Riley interrupts. My father said, you know, he died when they nailed him. They put the nails in his hand and he died. And, and Ember's over there, Dad, Jesus died. And she just keeps going on. And then we get into these deep theological discussions. And, and, and Riley says, well, you know, why did Jesus die, Dad? Why did he die? I said, well, he died, you know, brother, he, he died for our sins. He died for our sins. And then, then Ember's over there, and she's starting to talk with her hands like Kim does. Right? And she said, Jesus died! <laughs> and I and I'm telling the Sunday school class, well, we've got to get the Ember to the resurrection. <laughs> we're sitting there, and we're discussing these things around our table. And, I, and my prayer was and is that these little olive plants will grow into olive trees. And those little trees that we have at the, at the breakfast table are going to be trees that are going to nourish other people someday. You know, because you think about an olive plant as a national treasure to Israel. And it produces food. Uh, olive oil has medicinal purposes. It helps heal pain. Olive oil is used for lamps that light dark places. And those little lamps around my table, that's my prayer. You've heard the concept that I want, to, I want to have living monuments, monuments to the living God. Those little olive plants 
that around my table are going to grow into olive trees that give shade and protection to those that sit under it. That's what the olive plant does, and that's my prayer for my children. Like olive plants all around your table. This man's happiness is in his family. And it says, Behold, thus the man shall be blessed who fears the Lord. So is he going to be rich? He's going to be rich in, in things that are important, eternal things. Family, the souls of men. Uh, over here in my notes. How is the man blessed? He fears the Lord. And the Lord provides for him, prospers him, not necessarily a material blessing. And he gives the man a partner, a wife, a loving wife, and his children flourish. The psalmist says, uh, sons, the previous psalm, Psalm 127, sons are a heritage from the Lord, children are a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. Then it says, For he'll not be put to shame when he contends with his enemies in the gate. And the city gate, the city gate is where business is done. Uh, where everyone in the city will come to talk and maybe even to debate. This man has sons that are going to stand by him in the city gate. Sons and daughters. And he's not going to be put to shame because he's got children. Thus shall the man be blessed, the psalmist says. Thus shall the man be blessed in the fear of the Lord. And, verse 5, The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And this speaks of a national blessing. It's a blessing to the nation. You, know, you heard me mention a while ago, I mean, it's, not, it's not rocket surgery. The godly husband and husbands and godly families, moms and dads, teaching their children to fear the Lord is a blessing to the nation. And we see that more than ever today in the breakdown of the home. Uh, I would see it as I coach my team with guys that were father, fatherless. I could see it by the way they kept their locker, and the way their dorm room looked, and whether or not they were on time, and how, did they, how they treated their teammates and their teachers. What kind of work they did, not only in the classroom and not only in the athletic arena, but what were they like off the floor? What did they do at night? I can see that. And occasionally I would get a guy that was a joy to coach. And inevitably, almost always, that guy had a dad. And I'm, I'm not even talking about godly dads. I'm talking, man, I was talking to Aaron this morning about one of them. He had a father, and he had a godly father that raised him right. And he, he was a guy that I enjoyed coaching more than anybody else on, that, on my last team. So it carries over. And you, you may see the good of and may, may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And then verse 6, yes, and may you see your children's children. And this speaks of a future blessing. That it's a blessing to see your grandchildren. Now, I, I look forward to that day and I hope I get to see them. That's a blessing. Peace be upon Israel. May the nation be blessed. May you have a long, fruitful life. Um, I think you've heard me say, I, I took Riley and Ember to work just this past year and some of the ladies in there, I, you know, I kind of like taking them in there because I get a lot of attention. <laughs> or at least I think I do. The girls do and they give them candy and they just get all, oh, look how cute they are. Well, the very first lady that saw him oh, these are your grandchildren. <laughs> and I said, I said, oh, I was what are you talking about? They're my kids. They're my kids. And she said, she looked up at me and she said, well, oh. <laughs> but, you know, I look forward to the day when I will see my grandchildren. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing for a man who fears the Lord. It's not only a blessing to me, but it's just like the gospel. When the gospel spreads, it touches everything.